pleased to have the opportunity to chair this evening's event. Unfortunately, uh, Lord David Willits has been detained in the House of Lords with some voting arrangements. Not quite sure what the subject is, but he said his apologies and asked me to stand in as chair. Um, I'm the Chief Scientific Advisor at the Department for International Trade. Uh, I've had many years in telecommunications before joining government, including many visits to China. Uh, so I was asked whether I would possibly chair this evening's event. I'm also a, a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering and actively involved with the Innovate UK Council, of which more will be said later. So welcome. Uh, it's great that we can talk about this particular subject here today, uh, particularly around this collaboration uh, that could exist between the UK and China. Do we grow it? Do we let it develop? How do, how do we handle it from a, an international point of view? But there are already a huge number uh, of collaborations which are associated with UK-China research collaboration. And what we can see today is the development is spanning many fields and many disciplines, not just in engineering, but in life sciences, uh, in food, food security, in climate change. And what we can see is that many of these have developed rapidly over the last 20 years as China has developed into the world's second largest economy. In my own historical field of, of telecommunications, we can witness uh, 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 the, the, the significance of mobile phones, for example, with over 1 billion mobile phones now in China, and China shipping more mobile phones than any other country in the world. So we are all benefiting from that type of collaboration, as indeed in other sectors. So it's clear there are many opportunities for advancing science, particularly to address key challenges, also opportunities to address the scale challenges that may be existing globally, whether through innovation and wealth creation in areas such as climate change and food security. On the other hand, concerns are sometimes expressed about R&D collaboration uh, with China for a number of different reasons, and we'll touch on some of those this evening. So in this event, we want to look at the opportunities going forward for R&D collaboration in the future and how we can these, develop these in the best interests of both the UK and indeed China. So we will have four speakers in a row. Um, each of the speakers will be taking questions at the end uh, of the presentations. Particularly, uh, we will have some people online via Zoom. So I may call on my great assistant, Gavin Costigan, to help me a little bit with some of those online uh, questions coming in. Um, and for those of you who are following us on Zoom tonight, if you want to make uh, and an ask a question, you need to use the Q&A function, please. Let me stress that, the Q&A function, not the chat function. And to do this, you simply click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, type your question and press enter. And if Gavin is willing, he might volunteer that question to the speakers this evening. So you can do this at any time. There is no need to wait for the Q&A to start formally. Uh, you can also comment on other people's questions and also upvote them with the Zoom system. When we get to the Q&A session, we'll ask the questions with the most votes, as well as with Gavin's discretion. Finally, if any of you want to tweet about the event, do use the hashtag, hashtag FSTUKChina, and that way we'll get uh, more attention uh, for these FST events, as well as the subject itself. Let me move on to the first speaker. Uh, we're very honoured to have Minister Yang, who is the Minister and First Staff Member at the Embassy of China in the UK, and a position that he has held since 2021. Minister Yang has had a distinguished career at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in China, most recently serving as Councillor and Deputy Director General in the Department of European Affairs. And before that, as Councillor and Minister Councillor in the Chinese Mission to the European Union. Who better to start this evening's proceedings than Minister Yang Jiao Guang? Please welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Short. Thank you, Dr. Short. Good evening, everybody. It's a great honor for my colleagues and I to speak at this event. This event aims to ex exchange views on the current and potential research collaboration between China and the, U the UK, and how it could contribute to wider diplomatic ties between our two countries. So I think this is both positive and important under the current circumstances. China and the UK are both permanent members of the UN Security Council. We are respectively the second and fifth largest economies in the world. 
our ability to handle the China-UK relationship will bears not only the interests of our two peoples, but also the interests of the world. And in our view, the code to achieving a sound relationship is not complicated. It is simple. The key is abiding by the principle of mutual respect in real earnest. As President Xi Jinping emphasized during his phone call with Prime Minister Boris Johnson last October, for China-UK relations to develop, develop well, mutual trust is the foundation. Mutual understanding is the precondition. And proper handlement of differences is the key. As long as our two countries follow the principle of mutual respect and develop partnership on an equal footing, our bilateral relations will enjoy a bright future. This year marks the 50th anniversary of our ambassadorial diplomatic relations. Over the past half a century, despite ups and downs, the overall relationship has kept moving forward. Bilateral trade has increased from 300 million US dollars to 116 billion US dollars. Two investment stock, which was almost zero 50 years ago, has surged to around 50 billion US dollars. Last year, China UK trade set a new record and Chinese investment in the UK more than doubled. British businesses took an active part in China's reform and opening up. London has become the world's biggest offshore RMB trading center. Our two countries have also coordinated well on issues such as global development and climate change, making contribution to the tackling of common challenges to mankind. Cooperation on science and technology is an important part of our overall bilateral relations. With an early start, solid basis, and enormous potential, such cooperation is showing a sound momentum. In 1978, China and the UK signed the Science and Technology Cooperation Agreement, making the UK one of the first major Western countries to sign such an agreement with China. In 2017, our two sides formulated a joint strategy for science, technology, and innovation cooperation. The first between China and Western country. Now, after more than 40 years of development, China-UK cooperation on science and technology has achieved remarkable results in modern agriculture, air pollution response, antibiotic resistance study, and biodiversity preservation. This has benefited the peoples of both countries and beyond. So China-UK cooperation on science and technology has never been one way. It has benefited both sides. The UK is a world leader in science and technology. It has built a solid foundation for science and is strong in original research. In China, thanks to greater input in recent years, capabilities of innovation have seen notable improvement. Technologies from the UK have made important contribution to China's development and progress. And cooperation with China also contributed to the UK's efforts to keep and improve its research capabilities. A recent report by King's College London shows that in Britain's universities, more than a fifth of research on many high impact subjects involve collaboration with China. In 2019, China and the UK collaborated on over 16,000 research papers, up from 750 in 2000 and rising from just 1% to 11% of the total number of papers in the UK. China is a founding member of SKA, 
which is headquartered in Manchester and has taken an active part in promoting and supporting its development. In biomedicine and new energy, Chinese investment has boosted the development in these areas here in the UK. In 2021, Chinese investment added 63 billion pounds to revenue in the UK's economy. In an age of globalization, China-UK cooperation on research is not an option, it's not an option. It is a must for both sides. No country can fare well or on its own amidst the, le the leaps and bounds of science and technology development. International large scale installations such as SKA, ITER and CERN needs the concerted efforts of multiple countries. In the age of big data projects such as human genome and recovery transcend national boundaries. Moreover, challenges such as COVID-19, energy crisis, food crisis, climate change and biodiversity loss do not respect borders. They are common problems and can only be addressed through the joint response of all countries, including China and the UK. Ladies and gentlemen, through years of efforts, China has become a world leading force in science and techn technology innovation, an important propeller for the advance of science and technology in the world. A recent Harvard University report pointed out that China has made great progress in many cutting edge fields and is now a global leader in many areas of innovation. Thanks to China's strategy of innovation driven development, Chinese tech companies, both well developed and startups, have achieved continuous progress in sound business environment and grown into multinational corporations with a global vision. They are globally competitive. China is one of the first countries to realize the commercial use of 5G technology. It has been the global leader in the building and planning of 5G networks. As of today, there are 1.56 million 5G base stations in China, accounting for over 70% of the world's total. China has the world's 40.3% of 6G patent applications, the highest share of all countries. China also leads the world on green energy technologies. It produces 70% of solar panels and 40% of wind turbines in the global market. Another field that China takes the lead is nuclear power technology. Hualong One technology has been widely recognized and China's artificial sun holds the world record in terms of both peak temperature and sustaining time. In the meantime, China attaches great importance to IPR protection, providing strong support for innovation. In just a few decades, China has established a highly efficient modern IP system. In recent years, it has topped the world in the applications for both invention and PCT patents. China now ranks the 12th in the Global Innovation Index by WIPO and was the only middle income economy that made to the top 30. Data from the China National Intellectual Property Administration show that public satisfaction of IPR protection in the country increased from 63.69 points in 2012 to 80.05% in 2020. Surveys show that 69% of US business in China think that IPR protection in the country has improved. And 67% of EU business in China think that the effectiveness of China's IPR protection laws and regulations is excellent or adequate. History tells us that openness 
leads to progress and exclusion results in backwardness. No matter how the world might change, China remains unwavering in its confidence and resolve in reform and opening up. China will open wider at a higher level and enhance cooperation with all countries in a joint effort to build a community of shared future for mankind. Against this background, we are fully confident in the future of the China-UK relationship. And we believe that research cooperation between our two countries will embrace a brighter future. Thank you. Minister Yang, that was terrific. Some great examples there and some great numbers. And I'll just remind everybody, the proceedings are being recorded. So if you need a playback of everything that was said, it's also available in recording to, to listen to some of those stunning numbers and the scale. It also seems to me very important when you talk about the Global Innovation Index. The UK is fourth on that Global Innovation Index. China now at 12. That's incredible. But leading players could work together based on innovation in the, on that index. Our next speaker I'm proud to announce is Sir Oliver Letwin. Sir Oliver Letwin served as an MP from 1997 and in the shadow cabinet for 10 years and in government from 2010 to 2016. And, and through this role, he was an architect of the coalition and a senior minister for six years, serving as minister for government policy and chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. He chaired the Home, Office, uh, Home Affairs Committee and a range of other cabinet committees, acting as Minister for National Resilience and was a member of the National Security Council. He retired from Parliament in 2019 and is currently a visiting professor in King's College London and is the author of the recently published book. If you've not read it, please can I commend it to you? China versus America, a warning. Maybe Sir Oliver Letwin would say a few words about that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and to follow uh, Minister Yang in his uh, talk. Um, uh, I, I've been asked to talk about the context within which um, the question of uh, UK-China R&D collaboration now uh, uh, arises. Um, and uh, uh, that's a, um, a task I'm uh, very happy to try to perform in a brief um, set of, of observations, though uh, um, one could easily spend some days, let alone um, some hours on it. Um, so I, I, wanted, I was thinking about how to crystallize this into 10 minutes, um, this vast area, and I, I want to make really uh, three points and then to draw out uh, the implication of those uh, three points. Um, the first point is that um, in contrast to some other periods of uh, global history, uh, we are in a period in which uh, geoeconomics is unmistakably driving geopolitics. Uh, that isn't to say that there are no actors that are interested in geopolitics for its own sake. Um, uh, uh, this, this very day I have been sanctioned by uh, Moscow. And so I'm aware that um, there, there are players in the uh, global scene whose interests are not primarily economic and uh, who are still being guided by territorial ambitions and things of that sort. But uh, by and large, in the great scheme of things, um, it's geoeconomics which is driving geopolitics today rather than vice versa. Um, uh, and um, uh, if you want an uh, 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 a quick um, proof of that, uh, which I suspect is hardly necessary, as I, I doubt there's anyone here who really uh, would question that proposition. But if you do want a quick proof of it, um, it, it, it seems to be abundantly clear that the strategic rivalry between the US and China, which, uh, of course, there is debate both in Beijing and in Washington between people of differing dispositions with differing emphases, but 
broadly, uh, there is strategic rivalry between the US and China, and uh, uh, it's pretty bipartisan in the US, and it's pretty well, widely spread in Beijing, and it's essentially a geoeconomic rivalry that's going on. It's a question of whose uh, grip uh, on the world's economy will be greater, and who will outcompete uh, whom. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not the old Cold War, uh, it's not a uh, direct ideological strife, although there are uh, different, different values in the, governing the two uh, systems, certainly. But actually, that's not the root of the matter. The root of the matter is there is a geoeconomic rivalry going on. We, we've seen that before in world history. It's broadly what happened uh, as between the UK and Germany uh, as an incumbent uh, uh, leader of the world's economy, the UK and its empire were challenged by a rising uh, economic power, Germany, and rather interestingly, an unnoticed uh, United States rising in, in economics in, in uh, the beginning of the 20th century. So similarly, also India now appears as a major figure in the global rivalries because uh, its geoeconomic position is enormously uh, significant. So first proposition is geoeconomics is driving geopolitics rather than vice versa. Um, Second proposition, and this is really new, uh, uh, although it has precedents uh, of various kinds, um, I, I think it is, it is to an unprecedented scale uh, true that it's certain critical foundational technologies that are driving geoeconomics. Um, uh, uh, of course, the Industrial Revolution that led to 250 years of Western supremacy and uh, uh, left the Indians in the hands of the British Empire and uh, uh, led to uh, what many in China regard as a, a grotesque forms of uh, humiliation over a long period was a technological revolution. Um, uh, so in that sense, this is precedented. But that was a widespread technological revolution, covered almost every aspect of, of industrial production. And although it was uh, coal-based, uh, the technologies were enormously various. Today, the foundational technologies that are driving uh, geoeconomics are much more concentrated. Um, uh, there are people in this room that know far more about this than I, and I'm certainly not going to give some uh, absurd attempt to lecture this audience about it. But uh, again, if one is looking for simply one salient example, it seems to be very clear that AI and big data are absolutely at the center of the economic rivalry that's going on as between uh, US firms and uh, Chinese firms. Uh, uh, they are also absolutely at the center of the next wave of the industrial and post-industrial revolutions. Uh, and uh, he who controls the data, uh, he who is able to exploit the data through AI uh, has the capacity to transform uh, almost every aspect of uh, human life on Earth uh, over coming decades. And this is well recognized uh, both in the West and in China, and indeed where we're at it in India and elsewhere. Uh, and those foundational technologies are therefore central to uh, driving uh, geopolitics. The third proposition I want to advance it brings me to the point of this, this uh, seminar, which is that because of the nature of the foundational technologies that are uh, driving geoeconomics, um, science, deep science, is at the heart of uh, geoeconomics and geopolitics to a degree and in a way that has never previously been true uh, on Earth. Um, uh, I, again, I'm standing in the Royal Academy of Engineering, and I have no doubt that there are present people who know a thousand or maybe a million times more than I do about um, the old uh, technologies of the steam engine and um, Arkwright's spinning jenny and uh, uh, Stevenson's rocket and all the rest of it. But my distinct impression is that, that, that uh, speaking as someone that finished doing science at A-level, that, that even I can understand the scientific principles behind those devices of the 19th century. Um, uh, and uh, uh, they were essentially engineering rather than, than, than science. Uh, today, although of course the engineers are very important, 
uh, actually the scientists are incredibly important and are at the center of what we are now seeing. Uh, and so basic research and the translation of basic research into more and more applied fields uh, is absolutely at the center of uh, the capacity to win the geoeconomic struggle and hence at the center of geopolitics. Um, so those are my three propositions that, that the context we're in is one where geoeconomics is running geo driving geopolitics. Uh, uh, second, that uh, the foundational technologies, a few foundational technologies are at the center of geoeconomics. And third, that science and research and development of basic science uh, are at the heart of geoeconomics. Now that, that is a striking context within which to consider the question, how far can and should China and the UK uh, collaborate in uh, research and development? Because to collaborate in research and development against that background is of course to, uh, to play on a, a field that is absolutely at the center of geopolitics. It's impossible to regard it simply as an activity uh, with scientific consequences and consequences for humanity. It also has geoeconomic consequences and geopolitical consequences of the greatest possible kind. Um, so the question is in the light of all that, what attitude should we take? And here I move from uh, what I hope would be a widely shared analysis, which I think is broadly simply the truth, to my own personal tendentious and very possibly controversial view about how we should handle this. Um, my, my view is that um, without uh, collaboration, not just between the UK and China, of course, but between the West and China as a whole, uh, in these foundational uh, technologies, given their uh, centrality, uh, and in the basic science and the research required for it and the development required of it, uh, that leads to these uh, advances in these foundational technologies, without such collaboration, uh, we are inevitably going to head in the opposite direction towards uh, increasing decoupling and a separation of uh, economies in which uh, the West broadly becomes an economy and uh, is separate from the Chinese uh, economy and Chinese sphere of influence. And apart from the fact that I think that the direction of change uh, is likely significantly to impoverish both the Chinese and the West. And therefore, actually, while we're at it, the rest of the world, which depends on the prosperity both of China and of the West now, uh, and which is much in need of help, uh, the poorest people on earth depend uh, even more on the, uh, on the continued coupling of the Chinese and Western economies to produce the degree of growth which is required in order to provide economic prospects for the, uh, the global South. Uh, apart from all of that, apart from the fact that increasing decoupling through lack of collaboration in these foundational technologies uh, will impoverish everyone on earth, I think there is a, an even bigger problem, which is that as decoupling occurs, uh, instead of the trust that uh, Minister Yang was talking about, increasing distrust is bound to occur. As people separate, as they decouple from one another, as they cease to collaborate with one another, they become increasingly unable to understand one another and hence become increasingly inclined to distrust one another. And that distrust is a very grave danger in my view, uh, not, uh, I mean, alongside the impoverishment that, that, that beckons, uh, uh, and beyond that, much beyond that, it's a very grave danger because it can all too easily lead to confrontation and finally to uh, military confrontation. Uh, the whole history of the world is one in which, uh, as a rising power meets an incumbent power, lack of trust is very dangerous. So um, uh, my final proposition is that the only way we stand any serious chance of managing competitive rivalries, and there will be competitive rivalries in a situation where these foundational technologies are being fought over uh, economically and having their geopolitical effects. The only way we stand a chance of managing that uh, geoeconomic and geopolitical competition is to ensure that there is continues to be a large and growing amount 
of organized and uh, sophisticated uh, collaboration in which, however, each side needs to be uh, operating with their eyes open, conscious of the uh, likelihood that the other side might want to take advantage and uh, being therefore realistic and uh, uh, grown up about the needs for protection uh, of various kinds and the need for each side to be resilient against the other rather than being dependent on the other. That's a very difficult balance to strike. It's not easy to collaborate in ways that nevertheless ensure that you're preserving your independence, that you are not becoming excessively dependent on the party with whom you're collaborating, and that you are sufficiently protected from IP leakage and national security leakage and so on, in order to ensure that you can continue to collaborate without excessive risk. It's not easy, but in my view, it's necessary. And uh, I hope therefore that this uh, gathering and many others like it will help to ensure that over the coming decades, instead of moving towards increasing decoupling, we move into an era of more sophisticated and uh, eyes open uh, collaboration uh, and gradually build increasing trust. Thank you. That was great, Oliver. Thank you very much. Um, we now move on to our third speaker, uh, who is Vivian Stern. She is the uh, Director of Universities UK International, which represents UK universities around the world and works to enable them to flourish internationally. She has over 20 years experience of working in higher education policy and politics at national and international level. Uh, she was previously a, the head of political affairs at Universities UK and led the sector's response to several major pieces of legislation related to universities. Before that, she worked for the chair of the House of Commons Education Select Committee and as a policy specialist working on topics including quality, student experience, innovation and university business links. Over to you, Vivian. Thank you. I'm sorry you got the full bio there. It's um, it's uh, it, it's perhaps it doesn't justify quite so much, but there we go. And um, the first thing I want to say is I, I really welcome the opportunity to start to bring into the open a conversation that I think we we need to have as we move into the next phase of the relationship um, between the UK university sector and and China. Um, but I want to start um, in a sense with a tribute to the uh, to the. Um, astonishing performance of the Chinese uh, university and research system, because when you look at it from the perspective of uh, the UK university sector, you look at the speed and the scale of improvement and uh, increasing volume uh, of production in research and the rapid improvements in performance of uh, Chinese universities, as far as we can measure that through league tables. I think there is much that the UK uh, should take from the example being set by the long-term vision and ambition um, uh, that China is displaying in, in the fields of higher education and research. In, uh, in the UK, uh, um, as, as we've heard, the relationship between China has become more and more important in the fields of education and research. 11% um, of our research output now, as, uh, as we've heard, is co-produced with uh, Chinese uh, co-authors. Um, we have about, about a third of our international students um, are Chinese. We teach about 61,000 students, generally in partnership, uh, with Chinese institutions in China through various forms of transnational education provision. And we uh, are proud and fortunate to have uh, 6,000 uh, Chinese uh, nationals as members of staff in, in the UK university sector. We're deeply intertwined. And given the rising importance of China as a, a system in higher education and research and in, in geopolitical terms, um, in my view, it is absolutely essential that we maintain uh, and deepen and improve the, the strong foundation of relationships that we have um, between um, the UK and China. And I think it's also consistent with the general principle that I think we hold in, certainly in Universities UK, which is that the best research is uh, produced when people are able to work with colleagues irrespective of where they are. That, that our job really, as we seek to shape 
the international uh, research environment should be to try to remove friction whenever, wherever, wherever that is possible. So people aren't constrained by national funding mechanisms or, uh, or bureaucratic uh, boundaries. If they have um, a colleague they want to work with uh, who has access to insights, to resources, to data sets, to, uh, to methodologies uh, from which um, they can benefit. I mean, we are, are obviously in so many areas deeply interdependent and, um, and collaboration has to be uh, the answer to the many global challenges uh, that we face. And so the principle that I would start from is that our job should be to make collaboration between the UK and China easier and not harder. Um, having said that, I think we're moving from one phase into another in this uh, relationship. And that's partly driven by um, the change in, in China's position, not only in the higher education and research space, but in the world. Um, it's perhaps time for us to think um, about the relationship we would like to have um, in the next decade or two decades, learning perhaps something from the habit of long-term strategic thought, which I think uh, China exhibits. It's also in some respects a good time in the UK to be thinking about the nature of our international research collaboration because we're all absorbed by the question of how we want to uh, reform the basis for international collaboration. Leaving aside just for one second our relationship with Horizon Europe, um, Bayes is in the process of establishing a new framework for international collaboration and research. And that um, takes its, its stimulus from um, the UK's uh, vision of, for foreign policy, uh, which sets out an ambition for the UK to be a science superpower. And I think broadly speaking, from my perspective, if you think that it is a good thing that our universities are able to collaborate internationally in research, the wind is at our backs. It's understood that it is a good thing for UK universities, it's a good thing for academics, it's a good thing for our economy, and it's also a good thing for the networks of relationships we have around the world. And so now's a good moment to ask ourselves the question, what do we need in order to take our relationship with uh, China to the next level? And are there areas in which we can act to further reduce the friction that gets in the way of ind individual uh, research uh, collaboration? And there've been some great uh, initiatives in this field, perhaps things that in the future will be less, um, less pointillist in their approach. So fewer, very, very specific um, short-term calls that come and go in very specific areas that are constrained by rules such as the overseas development assistance uh, rules, things that are, are um, intentionally interdisciplinary, um, where ODA and non-ODA uh, uh, funded research objectives can be, can be brought together in a fruitful way. Um, expanding on mechanisms like international co-investigator schemes, uh, which I'm sure Christopher um, will say uh, a bit more about. And broadly, I think we could learn something about the deliberate and strategic approach that China has exhibited in terms of pursuing international research collaboration. If the UK is to maintain its position as one of the preeminent research systems in the world, what is it we need to do in order to um, leverage our existing strengths and develop new ones in areas where, uh, frankly, the technological and competitive advantage of the future will be found? But we have to be clear that in this more mature relationship between the UK and China, there are hard questions for us to answer and to ask ourselves in, in the university sector and the research community more broadly. We have to be able in, uh, in the context of that mutually uh, trusting and uh, respectful relationship to be clear about what our goals are, what our interests are, what our strategic objectives are, and also what we will not and cannot do. And I think that is a conversation that has been uh, increasing in, um, in complexity and depth, uh, and the, the frequency of those sorts of uh, conversations are increasing, uh, and not only in, in the UK, but all around the world, as people consider um, how international research collaboration, which has been growing very rapidly, needs to be balanced with, um, I think as uh, Oliver Letwin said, the eyes wide open approach. And, and I see this when I hear universities talk about the partnerships that they enter into, either on research or uh, partnerships around higher education. There is an increasing um, propensity to think deeply about what the strategic interests of the UK institution actually are. And to perhaps ask questions that in a more naive phase of international collaboration, 
uh, were, were, were not surfaced either at the strategic level in institutions or at the level of principal investigator. But I think that's a conversation that we've been having with ourselves. And that's possibly right, because certainly in my uh, neck of the woods, we've spent the last couple of years trying to organize our mental furniture, trying to work out what it is that the UK university sector needs to do in order to preserve the space to collaborate as we believe we must by maintaining the trust and confidence in the way the university sector goes about um, engaging in that research. And so we've spent a couple of years working out, you know, where we are, what needs to change. We've produced guidance. We've, uh, we've engaged in uh, many, many activities to help um, the university and research community adapt to perhaps a different way of thinking about this um, as a topic. But it isn't a conversation that we've been having uh, openly, frankly, without any sense of embarrassment with our Chinese counterparts, and we must. Because if we want, in the course of the next two decades, a deeper uh, foundation for scientific collaboration, collaboration in education, we need to be unashamedly able to talk about our own objectives, and to do that frankly in a way that uh, partners on both sides of the table can explain what is important to them. There will be some areas where we have to walk away and I think we should be absolutely clear that that will be part of the decision making process. But the more, um, the more we can have this debate in, in, the, in the open and with our Chinese counterparts, I think the, the better able we will be to achieve uh, uh, the aim of deeper and stronger collaboration in areas where it is frankly, not only in all of our interests, but it is essential that we work together. Uh, so thank you, um, uh, Gavin. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to start the conversation. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, to our final intervention, uh, Professor Christopher Smith. Uh, he's the executive chair of the Arts and Humanities Research Council, but leads for UK research and in innovation as the international champion. So uh, quite rightly, uh, he's having a few words. He's previously a professor of ancient history at the University of St Andrews, where he held a number of roles. Uh, he was seconded as director uh, of the British School at Rome, uh, the UK's leading humanities and creative arts research institute overseas from 2009 to 2017. Please welcome Christopher Smith to say a few words. Thank you. Minister, uh, colleagues, I'm uh, extremely grateful to be here. I'm very grateful to uh, the Foundation for this uh, invitation and for this event, um, which uh, gives us the opportunity to talk about the strength of UK-China collaboration uh, through a variety of funding mechanisms, including those of UK research and innovation. Talk a little bit about the impact of those investments and to think about how we can engage uh, in the future profitably uh, for the benefit of all people, uh, both in UK and China, but across the world. So um, the almost traditional uh, nature of these bilateral um, or quadrilateral uh, speeches is that we stand up and read out a list of the things that we've done, and a lot of numbers. So there are going to be some stats, uh, which I shall go through. But I wanted each stage to try to stop and say uh, what those statistics really mean. Um, the, the first set of statistics are just the absolute strength and power of China as a research and innovation uh, nation, but also of our capacity to work together. So China's research and innovation landscape has grown enormously over the last 40 years, second biggest spender on R&D, with a year-on-year -year expenditure increase averaging 11.8% over the past five years. Total public and private science and technology expenditures in 2020 amounted to RMB 2.43 trillion, that's 276 billion, uh, and 2.4% of the GDP, 2.4%, rather a totemic figure. Um, well done. Um, China has a large and rapidly growing research base, 2.11 million researchers, close to 25% of the world's R&D workforce. China's rising global importance mean it is more, not less important to work with China, even, uh, even with the challenges that uh, come with managing 
such enormous and accelerating partnerships. Even my own subject of ancient history and classics is now well represented in Chinese uh, universities, which I'm really excited by actually. We enjoy a strong relationship with China on science and technology that's remained resilient and the integrated review, a critical document for UK's positioning, uh, emphasises and supports uh, the position of us continuing to work closely with China. 2020, the UK became China's second largest partner in joint publications after the US, uh, and we see that collaboration is mutually beneficial. Joint papers receive higher field-weighted citation indices than papers written separately for both countries. Our joint collaborative research output has more than doubled over the five years from 2016 to 2020. Um, huge numbers of papers, 9,925 papers in 2016 to 21,154 in 2020. It strike me just how long it would take any of us to actually read all those papers. But the truth of the matter is that under, underpinning all of these statistics is a hugely powerful set of collaborative relationships that are built from the ground that are built from mutual respect and trust between universities and individual researchers in both countries, and then reach out to have enormous impact across the world, which uh, I shall come on to in a moment. What has underpinned this uh, relationship is the long history of partnership with uh, China's best researchers and some structural features. The UK-China science and innovation relationship is underpinned by the UK-China Joint Strategy for Science, Technology and Innovation Cooperation, signed in 2017. And there is an annual flagship challenge where the UK and China agree to enhance levels of cooperation in a specific area. We've done agritech, uh, healthy ageing, um, and we're hoping to work uh, further on One Health pandemic preparedness. And each flagship challenge lasts for about three years. Uh, and in all the presentations that I've seen, there have been really tremendous advances that have come from these uh, large scale multi-year flagship challenges. And one of the reasons why they are so successful is that they are jointly agreed. UKRI's work in China is led by an expert team based in the British Embassy in Beijing that leads relationships with China's funding agencies, facilitates the delivery of joint programs, measures the impact of UK-China collaborations, and provides, provides a voice for UK excellence in research and innovation in the world's most dynamic R&D landscape. And just as this year is the 50th anniversary of the UK embassy, uh, British embassy in China, so it is the 15th anniversary of UKRI's collaboration with China via the China office. To date, UKRI has funded 682 projects, and remember, UKRI is terribly young, uh, it's not, only been around four years, uh, 682 projects involving collaboration between UK and Chinese partners with a total value of £571.6 million. And UKRI works with Chinese partners through a full range of multilateral initiatives, some of which we've heard of, CERN, Dune, Square Kilometre Array, Antarctic Survey, a marvellous uh, moment where we all came together and respected uh, that extraordinary uh, um, continent, Belmont Forum, Global Research Council, Wheat Yield Initiative, Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, and so on. This means that there is a very rich infrastructure which is sitting underneath the research and innovation partnerships. And of course, they are sitting alongside the sort of work that is done by uh, the IT and other instruments of government. So this infrastructure alongside the personal partnerships and relationships gives us the possibility to see this remarkably strong landscape. So what? We can all sit down and write papers that nobody reads. Um, I certainly have. Uh, and we can, all of us, do this kind of work. But what impact does it have? That's what matters. Um, um, what I hope to do is mention just a few of the things that we've done, which tick some uh, of Oliver Letwin's uh, fundamental technologies. Um, UKRI funded research has led to China-wide ban on colistin as an animal growth promoter in order to reduce the chance of antibiotic resistance developing, part of a global health initiative, which is so important because if our health is not there, as we have seen recently, very little can be built. Collaboration between China's OSCA, 
and Oxford University, funded by UKRI in part, deliver COVID testing kits that work in as little as 15 minutes, which have been used to support international travel and the UK government's test to release scheme. New carbon capture technology incorporated into China's existing and planned energy infrastructure reduce the energy requirement of CO2 capture by 25 to 30%. Kaduri Biobank, which has developed the world's largest cohort study broadened vastly understanding the links between genetics and health and this model went on to inform the development of the UK biobank a novel battery technology is leading to the development of new fleets of hybrid buses in UK and advanced charging facilities in China and absolutely all of this is both about research and about innovation it is the combination of the two upstream research downstream application for benefit economically and societally and give two last example or one last example uh, which i know will be dear to the heart of at least one person in this in this room world-class expertise being established through joint centers such as the center of excellence for plant and microbial sciences a global center for excellence in plant science funded by bbsrc and the chinese academy of sciences and we do all this through the lens of trusted research and I would like to say that whilst we have all touched on trusted research in one way or another, critical thing about trusted research and integrity for me is that this is a matter of good practice in research integrity that is essential to every partnership between every country and every other country. There may be particular reasons to focus on trusted research and integrity in some partnerships, but we must focus on it in all partnerships because it is the only way to protect our researchers their work and to ensure that it is used properly there's significant appetite for us to continue and develop uh, these uh, collaborations vivian has mentioned some of the mechanisms uh, which will uh, bring to bear either in an association with horizon europe uh, context or a non-association with horizon europe we will be looking at targeted funds but most critically we will be looking uh, through this comprehensive spending review period at building fundamental research, discovery driven research uh, between UK and China and in multilateral relationships where we can together work on critical flagship challenges such as One Health and decarbonisation alongside other partners across the world, those in ODA countries and those in non ODA countries, exactly as Vivian mentioned. I'm going to finish because um, uh, there's much else to say, but I just wanted to say that uh, we, we talk about this all as if it's terribly new. And I fully uh, accept that there are particular issues that Oliver Letwin has mentioned about this uh, um, moment in time, uh, which, is, uh, which is special and significant, but we mustn't forget that the relationship between us is of long standing and the nature of our common humanity uh, is just immensely deep and it is the fundamental thing on which everything is built. So I'm going to finish because um, by my bedside at the moment uh, is a wonderful translation of Chinese poetry from the Tang Dynasty, uh, the second half of the first millennium AD. Uh, it is called In the Same Light. And if you read those poems by brilliant poets such as Du Fu, uh, you are reading about exiles, people troubled by war, people losing their homes, people falling in love, people losing loved ones through illness, people finding joy, people finding joy in scholarship, people finding peace and tranquility uh, in relationships with each other and looking to the future uh, over a thousand years ago. And here, uh, I'm just going to bring a little peace to us all in these troubled times. This is Du Fu uh, uh, in his scholarly moment uh, by a tree um, contemplating the world, uh, translated by Wong Mei and Carcanet Press's fantastic book, which I really recommend in the same light. In the abbot's silent courtyard, the colour of moss leads one deeper into the bamboo grove, sunrise, dew, mist, nothing amiss. The green pines look twice bathed. Coming off speech and words, I come too, glad of the heart's gladness. These are emotions and relationships which are deep between us and on which we can build. And through arts, humanities, science, innovation business, we can build a relationship which I think will make us stronger together. Thank you. Could our speakers come up for our panel, please, if you wouldn't mind joining me. Good.
second seat along. You go right there. Thanks, Adam. Okay. So rather than congest the stage, I'll, I'll do some of the questions from here, if that's all right. Uh, may I remind the audience online that we are now going to take the questions into, from in the room and online. And if you're on Zoom and would like to ask a question or make a comment, use the Q&A function, please, as well as asking your own question. You can upvote other questions, as I said earlier, and I can then see which online questions get the most votes. May I take the privilege of just asking a couple of chairman's questions first, and then we'll take the floor here and then online after that, if that's OK with you. Um, if I can start maybe with a, a slightly more controversial question, I think you're all enthusiastic generally towards collaboration. But could you give a few examples each of particular areas where you would like to see more collaboration between the UK and China and areas where you would like to see less collaboration between the UK and China, perhaps with reasons why? Who would like to go first on the more or less question? Feel free, Christopher. Um, oh, do I have to put this mic? Your, your microphone is on unless you switched it off. Okay. Oh, good. All right. Spend it. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Um, more creative industries. Um, AHRC is working with um, uh, Shanghai Academy, uh, Digital Academy, on the possibility of innovation incubator around the creative industries. I think this could be an exceptionally exciting area, uh, not just because of the possibilities of uh, the creative industries as um, uh, in and of themselves, but of the impact that those platforms have, and the audiences that they bring together. So that would be my more. And the less? And the less. Um, I think this is difficult. Um, let, me put, let me put this in a slightly different way. Um, rather than think less about um, a, a particular area, I wonder whether the pace of publication that we are driving ourselves to is actually inimical to the very best science. I mean, there's a bit of a race to you know, push the papers out and so forth, and we measure by depth rather than uh, the thickness of citations. I'd love to see us really getting very good at slow science. Hmm. Let's talk later about slow science. Vivian, any more or less examples, please? So I, I like the creative industries um, uh, uh, idea, but I'm going to say climate because I think that, um, you know, there is no greater challenge facing us all and, and China's role in working with, um, with partners, with other great research partners, and I obviously would put the UK amongst them, is essential to the future of mankind. So I would say much, much more collaboration on addressing um, addressing the challenges of climate change and the various um, actions we will need to take to um, adapt to the reality of the change that is already <coughs> happening. So that's what I would say. Unless, um, I think that um, in University UK, one of the things that we've done um, following up on the guidance that we've, um, we, we've published around managing risks in internationalization is to, is to um, try to follow up that guidance with um, multiple sorts of investigation into whether or not that's making any sort of uh, difference to the way that decisions are made in institutions. And the, I think the short answer is that um, by and large, um, senior teams, um, those, those people with responsibility for research, particularly in research intensive institutions or inter institutions that are used to dealing with um, the sort of national security uh, export control uh, dimensions, they are at a senior level um, there is uh, there's infrastructure, there is discussion, there's debate, there's, there are processes being put in place. But when you follow that through to the kind of tips of the toes of institutions that are large and, you know, will have thousands of members of staff and, you know, lots and lots of people who are very independent minded as they should be, um, that, that doesn't trickle down. So it's not about saying there's a particular area in which we should not be collaborating. But I do think that there is a need to spread the culture of um, awareness around um, the potential risks um, in, uh, in engaging in certain sorts of research where our own legislation um, prevents the, um, the either voluntary or involuntary 
um, sharing of, uh, of, of certain sorts of technology. And we had a very interesting discussion just before this about dual use. Um, and I think the president of the Royal Society said something kind of frightening, which was everything is dual use. And, you know, in a sense, that's the kind of journey we're on. It's not about saying it's not about mistrust. It's not about um, somehow fear that these technologies would be used against us by a particular country. As, as, as Christopher said, this is about generally speaking, having an approach to, you know, sort of research hygiene which means if, you, if something is critical technology, if it has a dual use application, you think very, very carefully about the extent to which you're, 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 you're um, exposing new knowledge and, uh, and outside of your own uh, institution and national board, borders. And I think that's the less, I would say, the kind of less accidental, more deliberate um, understanding of where risks might lie. Or taking Oliver's words, eyes open approach. Exactly. Yes. So. Minister Yang, you, may, you gave a couple of examples earlier. Would you like to emphasise any more areas for, for collaboration or less areas for collaboration? Uh, yes, Dr. Short. Um, following the uh, oriental philosophy, I believe that uh, one plus one is bigger than two. Uh, so I am for <laughs> increase, uh, increasing all operation in uh, all areas, especially first, green development and low carbon growth. I think that echoes both sides development uh, focus. The second will be on health, especially during the COVID-19 uh, situation, we need to strengthen uh, our research and innovation on vaccine nation, on vaccines and drugs, uh, to help the world get out of the crisis at an early date. And the third area <laughs> might be uh, the, uh, the, the uh, well, uh, art artificial intelligence or AI. I think this represents the future. And China is uh, uh, quite uh, advanced in this field. And I learned from my colleagues that Britain is also has its unique advantage in this field. Uh, so I believe that we can work together to ensure that AI can be properly used to improve our uh, lives and to, uh, to ensure that everybody benefits from this uh, sector. So um, I don't think we need to reduce any uh, cooperation in certain area. I think that's up to the market to decide. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think clearly we need to look at some of the enablers for some of those areas like AI and data sharing, for example. How does that work internationally? Is, are there standards in that area or consensus in that area? Oliver, would you like to add your, your, your views on more or less? Well, when I was um, teaching in Cambridge, I used to um, tell my students that the last thing they should do is accept the implication of an examination question. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm not going to accept the implication that there are you know, one wave one's hand and they increase this and decrease that. I I, I want to give an example of 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 the I, what I think is the right sort of balance. Um, uh, I'm associated with a wonderful institution that we've created in the UK called the Faraday Institution, which uh, some people in the room may be aware of, some people perhaps watching are aware of, which is uh, um, designed to. Um, uh, fund and um, monitor and, and encourage fundamental research in battery science, but then also to find ways of carrying that into um, development and commerce to the advantage of UK industry, create a UK battery manufacturing industry and hence uh, to sustain a UK car industry in the future. And uh, I think what we, we, we see very clearly is that there's a right attitude and a wrong attitude to collaboration, uh, not just with China, though China is a very major player in the battery sphere, but actually with any other country. Um, the, the right attitude is working out where the two sides have each access to some technology or IP, which is critical, uh, and where one plus one equals more than two in the Minister Yang's uh, phrase. Um, uh, the wrong approach is um, uh, assuming that it's fine once you've cracked the research problem 
if the manufacturing then goes off to the other party. It isn't fine at all. Uh, we, we, we're not spending UK public funds to create uh, factories and jobs in China or anywhere else. Uh, we want them in the UK. And so the right attitude is to enter into productive collaboration where uh, both sides have something to offer and the sum of the parts is uh, uh, greater, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, but uh, to ensure that it's greater, not just for one side or for the other side, but that each side wins and there is actual economic beneficial effect in both places. If we, if we get that, strike that balance right, then we can collaborate across wide terrains and there'll be some things we do do and some things we don't do because of applying that balance. That's great. Thanks, Robert. Now, there's a chance to pose some questions from the floor and the microphone's coming forward. Uh, I'll take the first one down the front and then maybe we'll take somebody down the back. So I think it's Bernard Freeman, former CSA, the Home Office. Bernard uh, Silver. I'm, I'm, yes, I'm former CSA at the Home Office, but that's not really the capacity at which we're going to ask the question. It's really the... it. Everything we've said kind of hinges on Oliver's idea of geoeconomics being essentially the drive of geopolitics. So what happens, and maybe I should pose this in an abstract way, what happens if you start off with an economic benefit, mutual economic benefit, and then you suddenly worry that things have gone into politics instead of economics? How do you cope with that? So this is a, a difficult question, but that's really the, I, I think that's the sort of, um, discussion will be interesting to have uh, for a few minutes. Thank you. Can you respond, Oliver, please? Predictions? Well, um, there, isn't, there isn't a sort of recipe book that tells you the answer to that incredibly difficult question. Uh, you have to approach this case by case. Um, uh, and, and, and when I said you have to have your eyes open, the, the first part of opening your eyes is to realize that every time there is a collaboration that has an economic effect, it's going to have a political effect, a geopolitical effect too. It will affect the balance, not just of economic power, but of political power. Um, and uh, uh, the next point is therefore, and this, this is something which um, uh, some of my former colleagues in the uh, free market wing, so to speak, of the Conservative Party would find very difficult to absorb, but I think is, is true. The next point is that the government, of whichever country it is, in our case, our government, has a profound interest in economic collaboration and its modalities and what is and isn't done. Uh, it can't any more than the Chinese would do. We, we can't sensibly sit here and say, well, it's fine, it's less safe fair. Uh, go on and collaborate and we'll pick up the pieces later. Uh, it will not work in the world we're in. In the world we're in, Apple and Google and Intel and Huawei and all the other large uh, corporations at the center of uh, foundational technologies are national champions. And you know, ARM, to take a case, is a very, very important British firm. And uh, it's supported by and connected with a very large amount of extremely impressive science. But it's, uh, you know, the, the government of the UK cannot sit there and just watch ARM and British universities and so on, collaborate with whomever it might be. Uh, it has to concern itself with the question, at what point does economic collaboration and scientific collaboration, research and development collaboration turn into a, a basis for the other guy out competing you? Uh, it has to apply the balance I was talking about. And, and, and if, if that balancing act is seriously engaged in, if government develops the, the capacity to involve itself in these things, in an intelligent way so that it doesn't balk really productive research, point that Vivian was making, but does actually invigilate, uh, then it will be doing exactly what the Chinese are very good at doing. They, they, they encourage their firms to cooperate, but they also pay an enormous amount of governmental attention to how they're doing it. And they are seeking national advantage. And rather than thinking that somehow outside the rules of the game, we should be seeking national advantage too. It's a perfectly legitimate thing for us to be doing. And that's reflected in the strategy, integrated strategy review that took place recently. Uh, gentleman in the third row, I think it's Andy Sellers from the uh, Compound Semiconductor Catapult. 
Uh, yes, thank you, Mike, for the opportunity to uh, raise a question. Fascinating discussion. Um, I was reflecting on the honest conversation and the eyes wide open perspective about sort of defending our own uh, uh, interests when, when we're entering into these agreements. And I just wondered what the panel's thoughts were. Um, does the UK need a specific bespoke UK-China agreement uh, in this area of collaboration, or is it a more generic UK anybody agreement? Is it, are the rules the same with whoever we engage with, or do we need to tailor them to sort of individual collaborations? Maybe we should talk about that from a mechanisms point of view. Do you want to go first, Vivian, and then maybe Minister Yang to follow? I would absolutely strongly advocate a, a, an agnostic approach to this. And the reason for that is that we have, I think we have a terrible tendency to miss the really uh, significant um, risk because we're over-focused on something that suddenly there's a bit of, I, I mean, forgive me for saying so, but there's political hysteria around. Um, and you, and my, I just would hold up Russia as an example. You know, I spent uh, two years, frankly, being told that we should be much more careful about collaborating with China, uh, you know, right about until Russia <laughs> invaded Ukraine, at which point everybody, you know, the, two weeks before that, I was in Moscow um, on a, a, a delegation organized by the British Embassy, uh, which was very uh, keen to, and, and I, the wind changed pretty fast, I can tell you. So I think that um, the point isn't about um, this mistrust of, of a particular country it isn't about, and I actually think, and I would like to take this opportunity to say, those of us in the academic and research community have a duty to call out a rising tide of sinophobia. I mean, I, I know that in every university, uh, you know, uh, academic staff and students who are uh, ethnically Chinese or may just be from another part of Asia have been subject to uh, racist abuse. And, and we have to be absolutely clear that that's not something that we're going to turn a blind eye to or condone or not regard as racism, which is, of course, what it is. Um, but the other point is this has got to be part of the culture of entering into partnerships. And if you live in my world, you know, the risks are really different depending where you're you're, you're um, developing collaborations. But in transnational education, I could probably name you 50 countries where you'd have to have a big hard think about entering into a t and &E partnership. Um, so actor agnostic. And you might want tripartite or quadripartite or multi-level collaboration as well. So not to be too prescriptive, but maybe mechanisms that are practical and flexible. Minister Yang, would you like to talk about mechanisms between the UK and China? Would well, you favor uh, any new mechanisms? Well, um, I should say that uh, we respect the British choice. If you ask me the other round, way round, whether China should establish a mechanism of cooperation with other countries, I, I think no, I think no. Uh, in our view, uh, such a cooperation should be universal and should be uh, broadly uh, supported by uh, the public and serve the interests of both sides. Of course, uh, every country has the right to seek its own interest, but uh, during this cooperation process, we also need to pay attention to the concern of the other side. That's the advantage of uh, further cooperation. And uh, I would strongly argue that uh, uh, China will not be a threat to, to the UK. We are not geopolitical rivals. I think we are highly complementary, uh, complementary in the economic and trade, and also in uh, research uh, and uh, innovation. Uh, I think uh, we still need to strengthen our mutual understanding, especially uh, for uh, China as a civilization of 5,000 years of history. And we are trying to understand uh, Britain and other English speaking countries uh, at our utmost. We learned uh, English uh, from our baby, as a baby. Uh, so we are trying, we, we are told to be a Roman while well, we are in Rome. So I think uh, in this sense, <clears throat> in the 21st century, um, unavoidably, China will be a huge opportunity for cooperation to many countries, including the UK. So I would encourage everyone to seize the opportunity and uh, we should refrain from a kind of a, a decoupling or cold ball mentality. And uh, I believe that uh, cooperation will bring more benefits. So uh, I would uh, say that we should not link countries into different categories. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. So a couple of more questions from the floor. Gentlemen in the second row, the microphone's right behind you, sir. Please indicate where you're from. Thank you very much. My name's David Law. I work at Kiel University, and my job there is to develop partnerships, particularly with Chinese universities. Um, I'd like to follow up on what Minister Yang has just said about how much effort goes into understanding English-speaking countries on the China side, and to contrast this with the ignorance that there still is in British universities about China. And if any colleague wants to reference this, uh, go to the recently published published pamphlet by the Higher Education Policy Institute. It's a very intelligent, long pamphlet about the failure of British academics really to understand as well as they should do uh, China side. That's not to criticize those who work hard on that. It's to say that we produce very few graduates in this country by comparison with China who really understand China and we need to do more. So my question is to my British colleagues on the panel, what can we do? What can we do to understand China better? Because we will have this hostility to China and to cooperation with China unless we understand China better. Vivian, can you take that first, please? Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think that's a, a point that's been made many times in the last um, uh, few, well, maybe, maybe particularly since um, Jonathan Adams uh, made uh, this argument in the paper published um, alongside with Joe, Joe Johnson as the principal author. I agree. We, we underinvest in, um, in encouraging uh, students to spend time in China. We have a lamentable deficit in language skills. I think your point, um, Minister Yang, about how early we should be starting to prepare students to um, develop skills in, in, in Mandarin Chinese, I think is absolutely critically uh, important, um, but also in research careers, we 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 don't. It, it's striking to me how little emphasis we place on um, research mobility from the UK, um, particularly at early career stage. And I think we, you know, I spoke earlier about um, having a sort of more strategic and long term approach. I think from infancy through to early career research uh, 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 levels, we should be thinking about how we prepare people to. Um, to participate in education and research in China. Um, because I agree, I think it's a, a woeful um, deficit at the moment. Christopher, would you like to add a little bit more? I agree with all of that. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of something to say in addition rather than just say yes. Uh, I'm delighted that my university, St Andrews, has opened a department of Chinese. Uh, I think it's a really good step forward. I think we talk a lot about the decline of modern languages, but we often, when we do talk about that, we talk about it against a very limited basket of languages. Uh, and I think that we perhaps should think a little bit harder about what our, what our modern languages portfolio should look like across universities. Um, I'm really pleased that uh, last week I intended with Vivian a consortium of UK universities with overseas campuses, which will include uh, China campuses, some of which are developing uh, research in really interesting ways, as, long, as well as student recruitment and mobility. So I think that's really exciting to actually see research grow in those, those hubs so that they can actually support mobility. I think I agree about um, the importance of mobility and permeability of our systems. I think the only thing that I would say on that is that um, given all of our concerns about climate and so on and so forth, given what we've just gone through, we should be taking more advantage of the possibility of doing more virtual work together. Uh, that never, and you know, I, I've lived abroad and um, immensely benefited from it and, and it's no substitute. Uh, but I do think that there are opportunities at the moment for us to just think really hard about what we can do virtually uh, and how we can build from those relatively low cost uh, um, engagements to something deeper at different stages of careers. And so uh, that, that might be something that we could all do quite um, quite quickly. Should we consider more fellowships or people, talent exchanges of some Absolutely. sort? Absolutely. Sandwich um, degrees, part-time study somewhere else? 
absolutely, I think we should be building that more into um, uh, doctoral training uh, grants, into early career grants, into the way that uh, UKRI is looking at collaborative PhDs, uh, joint supervision, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's all right. I think I do, there's an interesting balance mix between the country agnostic and the country specific uh, that we might want to focus on. And I also think, just a small plug, um, British Council, how much the British Council has done over many, many, many years. Um, and really, we should be thinking very, very hard about the importance of the British Council, BBC as well. These kind of organisations have done so much to support that engagement, which we overlook and undermine far too frequently, in my opinion. So it sounds like we've got a lot to build on. I'd like to take another one or two more questions and move to the online. So gentlemen in the second row along. <laughs> I think it's Peter Marsh that there. Yes. Thank you. Oh, uh, it's Peter Marsh of Made Here Now, which is a manufacturing website. Um, we, we, we've heard a lot, of course, about how important this sort of collaboration is, it is, and I've no doubt that's true. We've also just heard uh, a lot of about a lot of uh, British academics aren't really very good at collaborating with Chinese because they don't know anything about it or words to that effect, and you've agreed. Um, I know myself of uh, a number of British companies which really have struggled with um, with with when they when they're trying to collaborate with people in China for cultural reasons as much as anything. So, um, what are the success stories here? Can anybody tell me and the room where have there been really good examples where, on a research or commercial level in science and technology? where something really good has happened, either tangible products which we can buy or just um, really good examples of scientific endeavour like Chinese and British astronauts working together on a space station or something like that. Anybody got any <laughs> success stories? Who would like to start with success stories? I think, Christopher, you did give some earlier on about the research side, which has been collaborative. Well, may, may, I, may, I may have a go. I mean, I'll just expand a little bit more on the Oscar Oxford um, collaboration because I had the, the privilege of being present um, at virtually um, at the opening of, of some of the things that they were doing. I mean, if you look at what they're doing in this extraordinary collaboration, I'm just whizzing through the website at the moment, mathematical modeling and data analytics, nanotechnology and functional materials, environment and biotechnology, biomedical engineering and healthcare, which included those 15 minute test kits that are absolutely fundamental. I have been to all of our lives whilst we excavated the back of our nostrils for the past two years. Um, that is enormous, but it doesn't stop just in the COVID pandemic. That is underlying technology that will lead to innovations that will be profitable for UK and China in exactly the way that Oliver Letwin has talked about. And I think that it's building jobs in both countries. It's building phenomenal fundamental research and really innovative ways of working together. They've got this fantastic building, which is constructed precisely to make researchers who wouldn't ordinarily uh, talk to each other, the Oscar Suju uh, Centre for Advanced Research, wouldn't talk to each other, actually putting them into a room, which we're into a building, which is designed for collaboration. I know it's an immense success story and hats off fantastically. But, but let's bank that one, give Oliver a chance for a few comments. Um, yes, I, I want to give an example, which uh, I think is probably one of the most overlooked facts of recent um, global history. Um, you'll recall that at the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, there was an enormous amount of friction uh, uh, between uh, President Trump and uh, President Xi, and there was a huge uh, uh, war of words, um, to my mind, not, not productively. But underneath the radar, something completely different was happening, not just Oscar later, but right at the beginning. Um, uh, Chinese researchers who had developed relations with uh, Western researchers passed to the Western researchers the uh, sequencing of uh, COVID, um, uh, without which uh, it would have been enormously 
delayed the development of the vaccines that, that were the triumph, the sole triumph, if you like, of the whole COVID episode. Uh, I mean, it's a lamentable episode in the incapacity of the world as a whole to deal with the pandemic. We've all suffered from de deficiencies of policy and, and implementation, the UK included. But, but there's the triumph of the vaccines. Uh, and it, 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 of course, we concentrate, and rightly, on the huge success of uh, Oxford scientists and AstraZeneca and parallel things going on in Germany, the United States and so on, and indeed in China and elsewhere. But that would not have been possible without collaboration. Uh, uh, developed at uh, researcher to researcher level that withstood the geopolitical pressures. Um, and I think that's a pretty signal indication of the depth and importance of these things. That, that there are millions and millions of lives at stake in getting these kinds of collaborations right. We're not talking here about something marginal. Um, and when uh, various of the speakers, including Minister Yang, have talked about the need to collaborate in global public health, uh, that, that is a, a terrain of fantastic richness. Um, it is impossible, impossible to solve the antimicrobial resistance problem without collaboration between the West and China. There are 1.3 billion people in China and there are billions of people in the West. Uh, uh, with, without cooperation between the two, uh, you cannot solve AMR. Um, so it's not just that there are examples of signal success, it's the need is urgent and dramatic in scale. If I may add also our neighbours, the Royal Society, have long-standing engagements with their opposite number in China. Also the Royal Academy of Engineering, I chair the International Committee here in the Royal Academy, and we have relationships with the Chinese Academy of Engineering and indeed the US Academy of Engineering. Two years ago we did a Global Challenges Programme and we had students from all over the world working on common global challenge problems. Now, it's not to be publicized because they were actually finding ways of collaborating in that sense. So there are also some mechanisms we can build on. Can I take a final question from the lady with a hand there and then move to Gavin with the online questions? Hi, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Karen Salt, uh, UKRI. Um, I, I wanted to actually ask the question that you've circled back to um, with the panelists, but, but actually to um, prompt and provoke us to actually think about how we might actually share these types of partnerships um, and the types of knowledge and the deep strategic thinking. It's great if we can point to examples of different types of things in different fields. We've also talked um, much more uh, tonight about what are the di different areas where collaboration will, uh, can happen. But imagine if we had a network of information about these types of partnerships and collaborations, information about strategic things that worked well, um, and that actually could provoke not around just uh, a product or a particular kind of area thematically, but much more generic um, in, in terms of both starting these, these types of partnerships, but also going back to Christopher's point, the actual underlying work that's already there um, and that doesn't need to be started again um, and invested in again because it's already there, but it might need to be nurtured um, uh, or strategically invested in in different ways. So I, I, I appreciate Peter's question about can we point towards a particular type of thing that works, but I would like to call for that sort of more collective understanding and knowledge and strategic um, uh, gathering, because I think that's where we're going to get an, an immense amount of value um, as we try to scale up these types of partnerships moving forward. Can I take that as an opportunity to just see if you have any final wrap up comments on that and on the uh, nature of collaboration generally? Um, uh, would you like to go first on that, Christopher? Time is a little bit against us now. Um, I, I think we need to be hugely better at gathering data, presenting stories and analysis. And I'll put um, my hand up on part of on part of UK, right? It has been one of our challenges. I think we're beginning to get on top of it. Uh, I think UK, right? China office is doing some great work. The only thing I would add to be brief is we don't only want to celebrate our successes. We want to be able to get to a mature enough relationship where we can celebrate our good failures. 
Uh, and to celebrate the fact sometimes we do science together and it doesn't work out and that's fine, that's good. And if we're that mature, then we're in a great place. And, and meaningful to different audiences, yeah. whether it's the public, universities or industry or other players in this space. All yeah. those stories, all those audiences. Yeah. That's great. Vivian? Um, I think I'm going to agree with the, um, the sort of uh, emphasis on stories and also own up to my sense that we have failed to tell the very, very many hundreds, possibly thousands of fantastic stories of uh, discoveries, uh, innovations, um, uh, you know, um, treatments that have been developed as a result of UK-China collaboration to balance the narrative, which it to me feels more or less universally hostile at the moment. So I think we have to be better at telling stories. And I think perhaps that's also the way that we'll start to encourage people at an early stage in their research careers to think about what it might be like to spend some time working in a, in a Chinese institution. Um, and I think uh, we ought to also um, be a little bit more deliberate about how we excite young people about uh, China as a, as a country. I don't think you have to spend very long in China to realise that it's a fantastic place to, uh, to spend a bit of time. I agree. Minister Yan? Uh, to some extent, uh, uh, science and technology uh, cooperation uh, are based on mutual trust. On the other hand, on the other hand it can add to the mutual trust between our two countries. So we believe that uh, we, we are complementary to each other and China has a super large market of 1.4 billion people. And now we have more than 400 million people entering into the middle classes. So there are huge demand for British products and technologies. So I believe there are huge potential. We should not politicize uh, everything. And so long as we uh, adhere to the principle of mutual respect, there will be huge potential for uh, research and innovation cooperation. Thank you. And finally, Oliver? Oh, I don't have anything to add. Well, thank you. Uh, can we please thank all our great panelists for this evening and their contributions? Minister Yang, uh, Sir Oliver Yet Letwin, Vivian Stern, and Professor Christopher Smith. And just to let you know, there will be an email survey following this event, and we very much appreciate your feedback, the good bits, the bad bits, things that were missing, suggestions, all welcome. We didn't have any online questions, so it's not that I just switched off Zoom. <laughs> let me stress that. There were, there were no significant ones. Uh, but the next meeting of the Foundation for Science and Technology is on the 18th of May, and the topic will be increasing interdisciplinarity in UK R&D. And the speakers include Professor Dame Ottoline Laser, the Chief Executive of UKRI, and the details are available on the FST website. So thank you for everybody who's joined us here today and online, all of you. Uh, there will be apparently canapes and uh, drinks served outside. Please do networking and give us the good feedback to say what the FST can do better. And thank again all our speakers for taking part. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>